All right. Good morning, everyone. Start being, uh, we'll start being punctual here this morning, being the military and all. We hit the critical mass of people all signing in at one time. So I'll start my introduction for uh, Dr. Larson, uh, Lawson. Great way. You need more coffee this morning. But, uh, so a uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Michelle Lawson, uh, currently an adolescent fellow at uh, San Antonio Uniformed Services Health and Education Consortium, or SHASEC, as we all know it. Uh, she's an assistant professor at uh, USU with the Department of Pediatrics. She graduated from the United States Air Force Academy with honors in 2007 and went on to graduate from uh, USU in 2011. She completed her pediatric residency at Shawshank. She did tours as a general pediatrician at Lackland Air Force Base, Anderson Air Force Base, and Nellis Air Force Base prior to serving her uh, current adolescent medicine fellowship. Uh, where she's currently at. Uh, we have great uh, pleasure of her waking up early for us this morning down in San Antonio. Uh, so uh, welcome, uh, Michelle. Uh, I have a sign-in uh, sheet here um, uh, with a QR, uh, QR code, uh, and uh, I have another slide at the end, uh, which will, in case you miss it here first, but we'll switch it over to Dr. Uh, Lawson. So please give a great USU virtual welcome. And thanks so much. So I am actually looking, um, and Brian, I should have actually checked this before, but it, I don't actually have the the um, option to share my screen. To try again. Let's see. Start share. Let's. Oh, here we go. Okay, I found it. Good. All right. So thank you so much for um, for your time and attention this morning. I really appreciate it, and I'm very excited to talk about this uh, about uh, my presentation today. Um, so I'll be talking about the impact of COVID-19 on the mental health of military uh, connected children and uh, children and adolescents. So maybe here we go. Uh, so I have no disclosures. Um, and then I'd also like to acknowledge um, Dr. Shanna Hansen and Dr. Barbara Boucher, um, who were instrumental in helping me collect the information, the references, and creating some of the tables that are present um, in this topic today. So the objectives um, at the completion of this presentation, I hope um, that this will help to understand the current trends of COVID-19 um, uh, globally on child and adolescent mental health uh, and help, become familiar, help you become familiar with the challenges faced by the Department of Defense um, and, their, and families impacted um, during the pandemic. Recognize the potential limitations and in accessibility and barriers to obtaining mental health services by our military connected youth. And then finally, uh, to review some available screening tools and resources, um, to hopefully to empower primary care um, pediatric professionals and even pediatric subspecialists to address and manage um, the mental well being of our families. So since the pandemic was declared by the WHO on 11 March, uh, profound interruptions in systems and services that operate to support mental health and the mental well-being of families has occurred. So families have weathered disruption to school, extracurricular environments, empl um, employment and financial concerns, home confinements, um, and restricted peer interactions uh, given the social distancing requirements. Um, on top of that, we have fluctuating sur surges of COVID-19 infection rates, um, potentially limited health resources, and now mutating viral strains that's contributed to this prolonged disruption of normalcy. So I like this picture because it's really from 2020. Um, and at the end of the syringe, it shows uh, 2021, the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, so now it is, I think it's very fitting. It's now December 1st of 2021. And I still think that the that light at the end of the tunnel um, would still be appropriate if you switch this today um, to reflect 2021. So um, for while there's a growing body of literature describing COVID-19 um, in children and adolescents in the general population, there's actually few official reports of the effects of COVID-19 on the estimated 1.7 million children of active duty and reserve military personnel. So children who are military connected usually have unique needs and experiences and compared with peers, which we'll go over later. Um, but there's really sparse literature available. So, so, so first we're gonna start by um, reviewing some of the published studies on um, child and adolescent mental health. Uh, globally. Then we're going to review um, some long-term effects of reverse childhood events and how that might relate to the pandemic. 
Um, I'd like to talk about how military children do have those unique needs and experiences that actually may put them in a higher risk category um, during this pandemic. And then finally, sum up by briefly stating um, what we can do in terms of uh, screening and assessment and management. And I'm going to emphasize briefly because that can be a topic in, an, in a presentation in and of itself. Um, but we'll at least go through some um, some things that uh, you can you can enforce in your in your practices. All right, so let's start off with China. Um, for um, COVID-19 first caused substantial shutdowns and confinements starting again in China. Um, so early studies did raise awareness that there was a growing prevalence of psychological concerns in youth. Um, in children and adolescents, the original reports found rates of depression and anxiety ranging from 23 to 44% and 19 to 37%. So both of these studies were conducted in early 2020. They weren't longitudinal and were survey based. Zhao had um, more of an adolescent focus, so 12 to 18 years, they had more participants. Um, this was a select point in time in March 2020 um, using uh, PHQ-9 and GAD-7. Um, and again, their, their prevalence of symptoms are reported there. Um, if I'm mispronouncing these na names, I, it is not intentional, but she uh, et al. Uh, was focused more on the younger age group, so grades two to six, had fewer participants, um, but used the SCARED and CDI, um, CDI questionnaires. It was also, um, also self-reported by, um, by the app children themselves and not necessarily the parents. So parental permission was obtained. Um, turning our attention to the United States um, in comparison, um, in June 2020, this survey found that more than uh, one, in four, one in four parents or about 27% cited worsening mental health for themselves, and one in seven, so about 14%, reporting uh, worsening mental health concerns for their children. So this was a national survey of parents, not the youth, um, with children in school up to age 18. Uh, this investigation's aim was to measure changes in health status, insurance status, food security, and use of public food assistance resources. Um, changes in childcare and changes or the use of healthcare services since the pandemic uh, began. It was about a thousand or so responses. Overall, one in 10 families reported worsening parent and child um, uh, mental health. And in these families, the ones that reported both parent and child, um, child effects, um, about 48% of them had change in childcare status, and about 16% of them reported um, changes in insurance status since the pandemic began. So in this US study, um, another survey was conducted from hourly service workers with at least one child, young child at home between two and seven. Um, they had, they listed pre-COVID as February 2019, uh, February 2020, excuse me, and post-COVID as survey responses in April, March, April timeframe of 2020. So what they found was the frequency of COVID-19 related hardships and categories of job loss, income loss, caregiving burden and illness um, corresponded to worse psychological well-being in both the parents and the children. So on table two on the left, the pre-COVID answers are in the first column. Um, the, second, the second column highlighted in red are the post-COVID responses. The largest difference really between pre and post um, were in the last two lines. So parents work today or parents work disrupted today. So everything else had slight kind of some increases uh, for the most part, but the most substantial differences were again in those last two lines regarding employment. Um, in table three on the right, the list of per a percentage of parents that uh, reported COVID hardships um, are listed. And then they also uh, provided those that experienced cumulative hardships, uh, the more hardships, I'm sure it's no surprise, the more hardships that they experienced, the worse their psychological well-being. So this is a for these tables or sorry figures are pulled from a meta analysis published in 2021. It's one of the largest um, largest meta analyses to date regarding child and adolescent depression and anxiety symptoms. Um, they basically found that um, both anxiety and depression um, 
the pooled estimates are basically double pre-pandemic uh, pre-pandemic findings. The figure on the left is depression. Um, the di the diamonds at the bottom um, represent the pooled estimates. Um, the figure on the right is anxiety. And as you can see, there's like, significant variance depending on the study on the frequency of reported symptoms. So this pooled estimates um, is kind of, again, on the uh, doesn't fully encompass where uh, specific locations may be, uh, may be experiencing uh, more hardships, more restrictions. Um, so just keeping that in mind. I know this is really small print, but this is from that same meta-analysis, uh, and I like it a lot because, again, it's one of the largest uh, that I was able to find. Um, but what I'd like to point out that even though this was published in August 2021, if you look at the, the list of studies and then their data collection dates, the latest was around the June-July 2020 timeframe. So this is over a year old. Um, the pandemic is still going on. Um, and I know, I, I know, I, I think we can all speak to the fact that, especially in the U.S., a lot of events happen after the summer of 2020 that could be impacting the mental health of, um, of our families. So further peaks in COVID-19 cases uh, in large areas of the country, um, still social restrictions, extracurricular activities were canceled or, or delayed, and then changes in educational platforms um, and the methods of learning. Current prevalence of depression and anxiety today, as of December 2021, remains unknown. So I can't speak to whether um, a peak of mental health symptoms has already occurred or has yet to occur. Though anecdotally, I would argue that there remains a high proportion of visits dedicated to mental health in my practice and in, uh, in our practice in JBSA. Um, and that's even higher than normal that you would expect in an adolescent clinic. So, so far we've, like, we've reviewed studies that are based off of surveys and self-reports, and, um, and self but um, taking a look at objective numbers, they correspond to those um, self-reported studies. So healthcare utilization, um, Fair Health is a, um, it maintain, is a private, um, maintains private healthcare uh, records from um, private insurance, the number of mental health claims involved in intentional self-harm, substance use, overdose, and mental health diagnosis increased as compared to similar months in 2019. And the figure on the right is a graphic re um, representation of the percentage change in mental health claims in green in 2020. So notice all the green is above 0%, showing an increase from, that, from 2019. Um, and that's in comparison to the blue, which is uh, which is showing medical claims. So there was overall a lower number of medical claims uh, in 2020, but a higher percentage and an increased amount of mental health. So although not graphically depicted in the Northeast in this um, Fair Health database, in August 2020 alone, there was a 334% rise in their in report records of intentional self-harm claims in the 13 to 18, 18 age group. So I think that's huge. And the Northeast, I also don't think that comes as any surprise because the restrictions on the COVID surges were a lot higher um, in that area of the country for a lot longer. So regardless of insurance, private or not, um, trends in the U.S. emergency departments show rising rates of visits for mental health conditions, suicide attempts, and overdoses as well. The, so the National Syndromic, uh, Syndromic Surveillance Program, there, or the NSSP, um, captures about 70% of the U.S. emergency departments for more than 3,500 EDs across the U.S., um, covering 48 states and Washington, D.C. So it's a pretty robust um, database. So data from the NSSP were used in um, both of these studies. The one on the left, so Holland et al., um, is more of an adult-based study, um, but showed e weekly e um, emergency room visit volume decreased after COVID-19 COVID mitigation measures started. However, the median visit, visit counts were higher in 2020 for mental health conditions, suicide attempts, drug and op opiate overdoses, and they were lower for intimate partner violence and child abuse and neglect. Um, what's important about this is that it, um, it 
shows or suggests that the emergency use, uh, emergency department use and priorities for care definitely shifted. The study on the right is um, only a, a, a pediatric study. So 12 to 17 year, uh, year olds were included and just overall showed a 31% increase in proportion of the mental health related emergency room visits. And these trends have not plateaued. So those were from 2020. Um, through March 2021, using the same NSSP database, um, the mental health impact um, was shown to not have yet plateaued. The mean weekly number of, uh, of emergency room visits for suspected suicide attempts was 22.3% higher last summer, um, but 39.1% higher earlier this year. So this figure was taken from, um, from that um, most recent study. Um, and it's just, show, this, this graph is only showing females. Um, they show difference, uh, a different graph for males, but I wanted to show this one as um, females overall had higher trends of increasing rates. Um, the dotted line is 2019, got the kind of longer dashed line is 2020. And then uh, 2021 is that solid line um, towards the left-hand um, side of the chart. So you can see their, their significant rise in rates. Oh, sorry. The long lasting physical and psychological effects caused by the pandemic um, are really unknown, um, especially as it, it persists. And as already mentioned, none of the self reported studies or, um, or trend reports are of sufficient length to accurately, accurately predict future effects. But the best that we can do right now is hypothesize and prepare accordingly. And I mentioned this because of um, known adverse um, outcomes or long-term outcomes related to adverse childhood events or ACEs. So we know, um, and research has consistently shown, that early exposure to stress in children can impact their future health. Adult studies suggest that exposure to ACEs correlate to future mental health and chronic diseases. And some of the most prevalent types of ACEs are economic hardship and parent or guardian divorce or separation. So children living in poverty, families with young or single parents, families with significant parental stressors are more likely to be exposed to ACEs. Um, and many of these same risk factors associated with social, are associated with social inequities, housing, education, employment, access to healthcare, all of which has been affected by the pandemic. Uh, social inequities are contributing factors to morbidity and mortality associated with, uh, with COVID-19 infection. And uh, again, just the ramifications of the restrictions. But how does that all affect military connected youth? So as of right now, again, nothing is definitive, but let's try to create a, an overarching picture based on um, what we know of military experiences um, in, in the historic past. So in April, 2021, the uh, DHA or the Department of Health Agency presented data on the effects of COVID-19 on military families during this um, clinical community speaker series. Uh, so at one presentation, um, they referenced a survey that stated 27% cited uh, of parents cited worsening mental health for themselves and 14% reported worsening behavioral health in their children. Uh, if you remember, this is almost exactly the number of percentages um, that were reported um, by, by Patrick et al. So challenges that were that were reported by military parents included lack of childcare, modified educational structure, loss of social experiences, decreased support services, and then, then unemployment for their military spouses. So which families are most at risk for mental health concerns? Um, Gatterman and fellow researchers found that deteriorated mental health was significantly more prevalent in families that had parents under the age of 25, parents with pre-existing mental health conditions, um, parents of younger children, and then parents reporting financial stress. So this is very concerning if it's generalizable because the military is considered a very young workforce um, with younger marital ages and, and more families with higher proportion of preschool aged children. So the, these demographic associations um, suggest and argue for 
are families being considered a higher risk for mental health concerns uh, throughout the course of this pandemic? On top of that, military connected youth all face additional unique challenges that have been identified and have threatened the um, emotional stability at baseline. So over 2 million active duty families, um, four major categories of stressors have been described. Um, one is frequent relocations. Two is prolonged family separation. Um, three is adapt adaptation to danger. And then four, living in a unique military culture. So the last one, actually some of them uh, or all of them could be argued to be potentially protective factors too um, in regards to resiliency. Um, but overall they can, they're also listed in that like fuzzy zone of stress versus protective factors. Research shows that these stressors um, are listed and um, can contribute to a decline of academics, increased behavioral health problems, increased healthcare visits, and the development of somatic symptoms um, in our military youth. So adding the pandemic into the equation, which caused disruption of relocation services, particularly in spring and summer, um, but they did happen. So there was just this nebulous period of like, I'm not sure when we're, when we're moving. Um, it could be this week, it could be pushed back another month. Um, on top of that, then when they finally did move, they probably moved into lockdown restrictions and some variation in their new environment. Um, so that could have impacted their accessibility to, to healthcare services their ability to develop social supports um, in their new location, and even continue academic curriculums um, in, this, in their school systems. Deployment. Uh, deployment is a known challenge to military families. Historically, commonly cited deployment stressors include that the prolonged family separation, the potential injury or death of service members, and then nonspecific traumatic experiences. So deployments, even without the pandemic, raise significant concerns for the mental health of military children and adolescents. Um, and as many as one in four children experience an emotional behavioral challenge um, based off of historic da um, data um, associated with deployment. But just like military relocation and PCSing, deployments haven't, um, have not completely stopped. Um, in fact, short notice deployment missions have expanded to include this COVID-19 task forces globally. So since March 2020, over 4,700 um, military medical personnel um, have deployed to support government-directed COVID-19 hospital responses in areas of highest infectivity. Um, and over 5,100 military personnel have deployed for vaccine administration programs. Um, and this data is at, is current as of November, 2021. And I don't think it's stopping. Um, so this were, were are these headlines, um, I know we're coming across my phone uh, over the Thanksgiving break. Um, so again, um, short notice deployments, um, the stressors that it can really can um, place on our families uh, may continue to occur. Deployment, PCSing, relocation, or re relocation stressors in conjunction with the pandemic, um, we have to talk about child maltre uh, maltreatment. So we already know that there is a potential of increased risk of maltreatment, uh, both neglect and abuse um, surrounding deployment literature. We also know that in non-military studies, um, health disasters and economic disasters um, are linked to increased aggression and increased um, and elevated risk for child abuse and neglect. With the US emergency room data that we recently reviewed showing decreases in the number of weekly visits for intimate partner violence and child maltreatment, um, even while other mental health, uh, mental health uh, visits have increased, this raises the alarm that um, these, specific ACE, these specific ACEs can, are actively occurring, but may be underreported, and because they're underreported, may be underinvestigated in both um, non military families as well as in our military connected youth. And I really hope that I'm proven wrong. Um, I do, but I do predict as we move forward, um, we'll find, we'll figure out the final rates and the final answers. Um, but reports like this may continue to actually confirm that maltreatment is occurring. So this 
um, news article references um, a presentation um, that was given by Dr. O'Brien um, at this year's AAP conference. So it's not published yet. There's no study out there to, to actually specifically reference, but she presented on data um, from nine pediatric trauma centers, basically saying that in her um, study population, she did find increased rates of suspected child abuse and child trauma. So what can oh, sorry, so what can we do? Um, based on demographics, the unique challenges, um, I would argue and again emphasize that our military connected youth can be considered a high risk population for worsening mental health. And as such, um, mental health care, resources, screening, all of which should remain a priority in our practices, in our um, treatment facilities, and really with our partner, um, partnered healthcare organizations. So the Blue Star Military Family Lifestyle Survey was done in October, 2020. And in this one, 25% um, of military families reported um, that their, their mental health needs were not being met. Um, the, in a, and, and this is in the setting of the fact that there's been an increased number of referrals overall um, in military mental health um, and military mental health pro professionals amongst beneficiaries. And this is again mirroring um, national non-military trends. So they, too much demand, um, too much demand, not enough accessibility. Also of note, minority service members experience, uh, reported experiencing more financial hardships um, than their white counterparts, um, also mirroring national data. So looking into our own, uh, our own area, um, here in San Antonio, we've noticed a 9.5% um, increase in outpatient anxiety referrals in 2020 as compared to 2019 a 5% increase in depression rates uh, or new diagnosis of depression um, in 2020. And this is um, pediatric and adolescent data. Um, so spanning anybody less than the age of 18 was um, how we pulled this. And of note and of interest is we actually had a 55% um, increased new eating disorder diagnosis in 2020 compared to prior years alone. So I, um, I have some theories to explain that, but nothing concrete. Um, but this is also um, something that's being noted nationally um, in eating disorder centers, is it just seems to be more referrals occurring. At the time of this data pool, um, uh, we did it for 2021. Um, the rates looked like they were going to uh, be similar uh, to 2020, which is still more than 2019, but not, again, a significant difference um, since last year. And this is in Texas. So I know our restrictions may not have been similar to wherever you are in the, um, in the country right now. Um, your local areas might have had uh, more uh, stricter precautions, more, um, more limitations in comparison to Texas or less. So your rates might be, look different, but again, this is kind of um, a reflection, hopefully um, a reflection of the Southern states. Regardless of the of um, the COVID nineteen restrictions, many in military installations are located in resource limited areas, um, so parts of the country of this country and as well as overseas. I found um, it was lower or lower than I expected. So um, fifty percent of military connected youth receive their general pediatric care in civilian offices, so not within our military treatment facilities. In comparison, 92% of military youth depend on civilian mental health care. Uh, so we are depending on our local civilian, um, our local civilian partners to take care of the mental health care of our military youth, um, even knowing that a lot of our youth are located in resource limited areas. With suspected rising rates of mental health concerns kind of paralleling the national trends, there's going to be that heavier burden um, that we're expecting to, to be placed on, um, on our local communities to support our families. But even before that, the pandemic, 
availability and equitable use of, uh, of youth mental health was, was a cause for concern. So not super recent, but um, from 2007 to 2016, um, there has been a, an increased number of child psychiatrists trained in the United States, but despite that, 70% of U.S. counties still had no child psychiatrists available. Um, and I think, again, it comes as no surprise, the child psychiatrists were less prevalent in low income and less educated communities. So there is a problem with, um, with resource, uh, resource utilization. Timely mental health treatments um, will then probably fall back on us as um, primary care providers and pediatric subspecialists. So then I looked into the confidence and competence of, um, of providing mental health care um, in graduating pediatric residents. Um, and I found this report, which is surprising to me. So this um, study looked over, at, um, looked our collective responses from over 2,000 um, graduating pediatric residents um, and found that overall, our trainees do not report high levels of competence in the assessment and treatment of mental health conditions. Um, now, this, there was wide variation depending on the program. Um, so they, they found that smaller programs, uh, so those with less than 30 trainees, um, tended to report higher levels of competence um, in behavioral health management. But overall, this wide variation across programs um, indicates that the maybe the primary pediatric community should create or emphasize creating um, standards for mental health training um, more robustly in our um, pediatric programs. I would hope that our residency programs would not report similar concerns with their ability to manage mental health care. Um, but as we continue to emphasize the importance of military pediatricians and military pediatrics, I would also submit that we ensure our graduating residents feel equipped to assess and manage mental health stressors placed on our patient population. Um, so who better to manage um, the stressors of our families than, uh, than those that wear the uniform as well. So educational strategies to integrate mental health training into pediatric residencies um, were suggested in this commentary recently um, published in the Journal of Adolescent Health. And it ranges anywhere from asynchronous learning, so a standardized um, asynchronous curriculum, all the way to promoting more stimulation exercises, almost mini CEX um, situations in programs. I know that we do, and this can just vary based off a of residency program, um, Simulations are highly emphasized for code situations, um, acute, um, acute situations, but maybe not as much or as frequently for that, that outpatient difficult clinical interaction. So the first step, I know this is also a very busy slide, but um, the first step in addressing mental health is screening for it, uh, knowing the tools that you um, that you can have to objectively evaluate patients and parents um, despite sub the subjectivity of symptoms. So there's many screening and assessment tools available um, that can be used in conjunction with provider interviews, but this is a list um, of, and just a brief list, this is not all inclusive by any means, but this is a, um, a list of, of screening questionnaires that are available at no cost. So these, these ones are free, um, listing the different age groups that they're looking into, as well as um, the, the specificity and spec uh, sensitivity if, if available. And treatment is also beyond the intent of this presentation today, but I did want to mention a few quick non-pharmacological recommendations to assist parents of young children as well as adolescents. So this report um, focused on a three-step brief CBT intervention in managing COVID-related anxiety, but really can be um, brought into for an, any non-specific anxiety. Um, so the first step being education or psychoeducation, um, validating that the distress and anxiety is occurring, that it's hard, um, followed by teaching patients and parents about somatic um, manifestations, um, justifying the, the symptoms that they're, that, that they're experiencing, and then teaching overall about mental health and um, the burdens that they may be experiencing. 
followed by coping skills. So there are um, a lot of um, patient handouts, websites. Um, there's a lot of apps out there um, to potentially help with coping skills, um, breathing exercises, but finding a few coping skills that you like to reference um, that you could at least, or resources that you could provide to parents and patients may be um, all you need uh, to relieve a little bit of, of their of their mental health burden that they're presenting with. And then finally, behavioral activation, helping them to create a safe, uh, not so much a safety plan as a feel better plan is a way that it's been described, especially for the young, uh, for the young kids. Um, asking them, what can your parents do? What can other people do when you're feeling sad? What can they do or say to make you feel better? And actually putting that in writing, putting that somewhere that where they can see can potentially help and give them an actionable item um, to improve their own mental health. This is one of the resources. Um, Children's Health has a lot of handouts um, and really great um, online pages, educational pages. Um, not just about COVID-19, but over um, other mental health concerns as well. Childmind.org was another good one um, that I like to reference um, and provide to families, especially the younger kids um, when looking through uh, family-based strategies. And the American Academy of Pediatrics um, has published um, clinical reports really dedicated to helping our civilian pediatric um, partners who take care of our families, since uh, there are over 50% uh, are in civilian practices. Um, but clinical reports, clinical tools, um, information to provide to them um, to help navigate our very complex military health system. Um, they can, it's for, Per the report is geared more towards the providers, but the tools and, um, and resources can also be given to our military families as well. So the militarychild.org, militarychildcare.com, militaryfamily.org. Um, and should you have a report from a mental health subspecialist that comes back into your primary care office asking questions on how to help that family navigate the system, you can direct into some of these websites or, uh, or the AAP's clinical report, which was updated again in 2019. I'd also like to share um, psychologytoday.com, if not already known and utilized, so families can select what kind of mental health professional they wanna see, including a psychiatrist. I know it says psychology today, but you can actually look for psychiatrists on this website. Um, followed by the zip code that they're in, the type of insurance that they have, their age, uh, and local providers in that area will then pop up. Um, so this is emphasizing that mental health referrals um, are not uh, needed from a primary care, uh, phys uh, primary care professional before, they, before patients actively seek their own care. So TRICARE will cover, uh, will cover mental health visits um, once started by the patient themselves up to a certain point. So I think that we can safely conclude that COVID has caused an unforeseen crisis regarding mental health in the United States. Um, but perhaps it isn't just the pandemic. Uh, perhaps it's a combination of multitude of factors. So racism, natural disasters that happened, political discordance that also happened, and perhaps long-term studies are going to show that military-connected youth are more resilient than their civilian age peers. Um, perhaps our military families will be shown to have had less financial concerns overall because of steady employment, or that our healthcare was found to be more accessible and more equitable, which positively influenced future outcomes in, um, in, our, in our children and adolescent population. But those future studies will be impacted by the care that we're continuing to provide today and the healthcare interventions that, we're, that we recommend. 
So as the physical health effects of COVID, um, of the COVID-19 um, infection abate, maybe addressing persistent mental health effects, the potential ACEs will be essential in creating our new normal. Um, so we as military pediatric healthcare professionals remain on the front line for this kind of mental warfare. Um, and I really hope this presentation today has validated the struggles and concerns brought to you by your patients and their families, or even validated your own struggles as a family member to a military connected child. Um, I hope it bolsters physicians practicing in academic centers, teaching residents, uh, to educate on how to screen and manage mild to moderate mental health diagnoses, um, increasing competence in the sorely needed area of clinical medicine. So I appreciate your time and attention. I'm honored to be a military pediatrician practicing alongside all of you. And if there are any questions, um, any comments, um, any other resources that um, those on this Zoom call have um, come across, I would love to hear them. So hi, Dr. Lawson. Um, I'd like to make a comment. My name is Veronica, Bachelor Development Reed. Reed. Um, are you able to hear me? I am. It's breaking up a little bit, but um, overall, I can hear you. Yes. Okay. Thank you for a very comprehensive review of mental health uh, needs in our children, especially the past year. Uh, you did mention, I just want to bring up or clarify, uh, psychologytoday.com is a resource for dependents of active duty. They don't need a referral. First aid visits are free. Uh, Non-active duty dependents will need a referral. However, if the family does go and search for a um, uh, therapist, psychiatrist, or uh, um, social work or psychology, not all of them, even though they may click TRICARE, actually are TRICARE credentialed, which may mean an additional $100 per visit copay. So they need to clarify whether they are a therapist who are already credentialed through TRICARE or that they accept TRICARE but are not credentialed. So I just want to bring up a difference with that, which we discovered with some of our patients. No, that's very, that's a very important point. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. That was a great talk. Uh, anything to say about like, do we, uh, Everyone got really quick on uh, implementing virtual appointments, uh, and you know we're all kind of a little late to the game. But uh, at least I, I had a little bit more access to care uh, than you know because no one was seeing anyone in, in patient. And I don't know if there's gonna be um, potentially more people doing more virtual rather than in person, or if there are any studies showing a difference between in person therapy versus virtual care. Yeah, so I know that there are in. Um, in the civilian population. Um, I didn't specifically look at efficacy and kind of um, how patients appreciated or not um, the virtual platform, but I definitely know there's nothing in, in um, our military population. So uh, there's just really overall a paucity of data um, for our, our specific um, children. So there's a lot to be learned and just right now extrapolated from, um, from our civilian counterpoints. But we're also moving to Genesis, so that's going to shoot our accessibility um, for a small amount of time. And I know it's moving throughout the country. The change to Genesis did not stop <laughs> despite the pandemic, so that may or may not have affected um, accessibility. I'm hoping not, but um, we don't know. It seems like a whole nother survey to do. Uh, but. A whole nother survey, which I'm sure <laughs> has is is coming or has been done. Um, there's so much with Genesis, so much. Any, any other questions from anyone else? All right. 
Well, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, thank you for uh, great uh, grand rounds uh, today. Uh, we'll have another one here in uh, two weeks. Um, and then I just want to mention that we are recording these and we'll, uh, we're working on getting these all uploaded into the USU uh, YouTube page. Uh, so people who might miss it uh, live will be able to get to see me at a later time. Awesome. Thanks so much.